Hello everyone, my name is Tamás Eisenbeck and in this presentation we continue on the topic of the water chemistry, mainly focusing on the various filtration processes in the recirculation aquaculture systems. During this presentation you will learn about the different filtration processes in the recirculation of aquaculture, mainly focusing on mechanical filtration, biofiltration, chemical filtration, oxygenation, temperature regulation, and pH regulation. In the mechanical filtration, there are two main components. The most commonly used in aquaculture are the drum filter and the sewer separator. In the topic of biofiltration, we will touch upon the nitrification processes and focusing on the moving bed biomedia reactor which is uh, one of the most common equipment regarding biofiltration. In the topic of chemical filtration, I will uh, describe how the UV sterilization works, how the ozone is applied for disinfection purposes, and uh, also different type of oxygenation processes temperature regulation and how to maintain stable pH in your system. The first step regarding the filtration of the water is to remove solid particles. High level of settled and suspended solids impose harmful effects on fish health, such as it can damage the gill, creates turbidity while making the feed less visible for the fish. Time to time, solids are breaking down and are able to leach out harmful substances as well. So they also provide habitat and potential growth for harmful bacteria, which needs to be treated. Therefore, we will discuss about the equipment that can help removing the solids from the water. One of the main components in the mechanical filtration is the drum filter. So drum filter is one of the most common equipment for removing solid materials which are larger than 20 micrometer. So there are also drum filters and mesh available with uh, smaller than 20 micrometer. However, that uh, compromises the water flow and uh, it's not really viable. So basically, let's discuss a bit about how the drum filter work. So the outlet water from the tank enters the, in the middle of the drum and, uh, and the water permeates through the mesh and the uh, solids which are larger than the mesh size are deposited on the mesh and uh, so time to time as the mesh gets dirtier and more clogged so the water level inside the drum will rise and uh, that will uh, trigger a sensor and the sensor will uh, turn on uh, the backwash cycle. So basically, during the backwash, a pump uh, pumps water to a spray bar. It is a spray bar with the uh, various number of spray nozzles, and uh, it uh, sprays water to the drum. Meanwhile, the drum starts rotating and uh, cleaning, cleaning the mesh, which is uh, deposited in the deposited in the mesh, and uh, it all is going to be collected into a sludge collector tray which is located in the middle of the drum. Basically the cycle of the backwash uh, can be regulated by the level sensor. The level sensor can be moved up and down in order to increase or decrease the frequency of the, of the backwash. So the, normally the drum filter is the, is the first equipment after the tanks. It's located between the, the culture tanks and the biofilter. And it's also normally it's installed in a way that it's uh, fed by gravity. So basically it's positioned lower than the tanks. So it doesn't require any, any, any pump to get the water into the drum filter. It's also worth mentioning, so designing the drain pipe to the drum filter, it's uh, important that uh, the velocity of the outlet pipe should be above 0.3 meter per second 
to ensure the settling of the solids in the pipe. However, if, if the velocity is too high, if it's over 1.5 meter per second, then uh, the particles in the pipe may break up into smaller particles and it's going to be more difficult to, to clean. So that's why it's important to set the slope which guarantee you the water velocity between 0.3 and 1.5 meter per second. So as I said before, the backwash system cleans the mesh via pressurized spray nozzles. In order to guarantee the proper mesh clean, the pressure on the pump shall be set, set up or selected according to the mesh sizes. The larger than 100 micron mesh requires for around 4 bar pressure. The mesh size between 63 and 90 micron requires pressure around 5 bar. The 36 and 45 micrometer mesh needs around 7 bar pressure, while the really fine mesh, which is around 20 26 micron, requires at least 10 bar high pressure. There's a wide variety available regarding the mesh, so it ranges between 10 and 500 micrometer. However, the most commonly used in aquaculture is between 40 and 60 micron. This is these are the ones that probably you're gonna use the more, and uh, and you're gonna see the more in the market. The other common method to remove solid particles from the water is the installation of a swirl separator or so-called radial flow vessel, which is a conical shaped vessel where the water enters either from the bottom or the top tangentially to the side and creates a downward vortex that directs the suspended materials downward to the bottom of the tank where the sludge is going to deposit and that can be easily removed by siphoning it out or installing a valve on the bottom. So the clean water leaves the vessel from the top via an overflow pipe and, uh, and then it returns back to the system. There are advantages and disadvantages of the sewer separator. So the advantages are that Actually, it allows to collect sludge from individual tanks, not only from the from the main system, but individually from each tank, which is really useful by by nutritional tires, especially. They are relatively cheap. They have a low investment and uh, and also low operational cost. However, they are not suitable for the removal of suspended solids and. Uh, they also require regular manual labor. The vessels must be cleaned and drained in a regular basis, at least in normal operation, at least once a day. The other main, one of the main processes of uh, filtration of recirculation of percussion system water is the biofiltration. So basically, Harmful ammonia accumulates in the in the biofilter in the tanks via the metabolism of the fish, and uh, it's uh, the biofiltration is an important step to important step to oxidize harmful ammonia into non-toxic nitrogen compounds. One of the most common ways to remove ammonia from the system is uh, is the nitrification. So as I said before, so ammonia comes from the metabolism of fish and it can come either in ionized or unionized form. The unionized NH3 form is the more harmful one and uh, therefore the ammonia shall be converted into nitrate. Nitrate is uh, less, much less toxic to fish than, than ammonia. Nitrification is a two-step process. So the, in the first step, uh, first step is the so-called nitritation, performed by the autotroph nitrosonomous bacteria, during which process the ammonia is oxidized into nitrite. Nitrite is still harmful for fish, therefore the concentration must be maintained uh, below one milligram per liter. Nitrification 
happens both in the unionized and ionized form of the, of the ammonia. During the second step, so nitrite is oxidized into nitrate by another type of bacteria or group of bacteria called the nitrobacteria. They convert the nitrite into nitrate, which is substantially less harmful than nitrite. Although it can accumulate in the water, so therefore regular water exchange is necessary to keep the concentration at least below 400 mg per liter. One of the most common biofilter type in recirculation aquaculture is the so-called moving bed biomedia reactor or moving bed biofilm reactor, which uh, is uh, basically a, a big tank with, uh, with the biomedia inside, uh, which, uh, which is moved by a, normally by an air pump via uh, an air grid, so it creates bubbles that uh, agitates the biomedia inside inside the tank. So it, it's really important to size the biofilter properly and the sizing of the biofilter depends on the total ammonia nitrogen production per day which uh, in turn depends on the so how much fish actually we go in the cultural tanks. So, so the, the stock density determines how much feed we give the fish and uh, we also need to know the protein content of the feed. So by these numbers we can, we can calculate the, how much biomedia we need in order to remove, uh, in other words, oxidize all the ammonia in the system. So, it's a, it's a really important step in designing the, the REST system because uh, it can potentially limit our, our production. So, so as I said, so inside the, the biofilter, so the biomedia is, the biomedia are suspended in the water and agitated via aeration. And uh, so this biomedia provide uh, an environment for, uh, for the nitrifying bacteria to grow. And also the aeration provides additional oxygen to, to, the, to, the, to the fish. So it's also, so before, before putting the tanks into the system, it's an important step to measure the biofilter. So basically, let the bat nitrified bacteria go to a certain population that is going to be able to, to oxidize all the ammonia in the system. So during this process, it takes like a couple of weeks, depends on the size of the biofilter. And uh, so the biofilter is fed by normally by ammonium chloride. And also, if it's a large system and you have a limited amount of time, you can also seed, so you can buy bacteria and, uh, and uh, put them into the biofilter to accelerate the population growth. Is, uh, it's also important to mention that uh, so the water exchange is, uh, is highly recommended in, in the US. So it depends on the water quality and uh, quality of the filtration system, you need to exchange, uh, I would say, between 10 to 25% of the water in a daily basis. However, if, you, if your water source has a lower, a much lower, a much higher temperature than, uh, than uh, in your system water, then you have to make sure that uh, you top up the biofilter gradually because, uh, because the temperature shock can actually kill the bacteria in your biofilter and, uh, and compromises the, the biofiltration process. And also, in the, it's important to mention that, uh, that when you design the drum filter, you shall not remove all the organic content, all the solids, from the from the water because 
the biofilm and the nitrifying bacteria also need uh, organic carbon to grow. So the biomedia inside the biofilter are specifically designed to maximize the surface area in relation to the volume and uh, they are also designed to maintain ideal buoyancy in the, in the, and uh, being suspended in the water. So the density of the biomedia shall depend on whether it is used in freshwater or seawater. So as you know that uh, the seawater has a has a higher higher buoyancy compared to so this sort of seawater is denser than the freshwater so that's that's why so the elements uh, float better in seawater than in, in freshwater so in a, so when you buy biomedia so there's one number you need to check it's called the VTR which stands for the volumetric total ammonia nitrogen removal rate which uh, which uh, actually so this is normally measured by by the manufacturer and the, and the producer of the biomedia so that gives you gives you a number that uh, that uh, so in a certain volume how much uh, total ammonia the biomedia can uh, can uh, oxidize into into harmless uh, nitrogen compounds so to be honest uh, sometimes it's difficult to find so the nowadays these biomedia in a in a S. so the rule of thumb is uh, the vtr is uh, around 350 gram per day the foam, foam fractionation is a method to to remove uh, protein fat, lipids fats and uh, and uh, other solubles from the from the water and uh, one of the most common equipment is the protein skinner which is used in in aquaculture so how the protein skimmer works in the protein skimmer the water enters from the top of the of the this column this chamber and it trickles down to the to the bottom so in inside this chamber so the air bubbles help removing the suspended solids by attaching to them and hence reducing the, the density of the solids. So this method is really effective of removing uh, hydrophobic substances such as oil and fat. So there is a biomedia inside the, the chamber which forms this bubble and, uh, and the dissolved organic compounds are attracted to the bubble by the so-called surface tension so however the strength of the force of the surface tension is uh, is directly related to the salinity of the water so basically the truth is that that uh, protein skimming is not nearly as effective uh, in fresh water as in seawater so it's a uh, it's mainly it's mainly applied in uh, marine aquaculture system however it's in a certain extent it's still possible to use in in fresh water so the the, the concept is that uh, the water shall be retained inside the chamber at least uh, between one and a half and two minutes for having proper skimming capability and uh, and the air supply shall not exceed 13 percent basically because if you have too much air that compromises the the quality of the skimming so one of the most famous authors on recirculation aquaculture is 
is Michael Timmons and uh, so in his book he he says that the rule of thumb is actually 20 liter per minute of air is needed per one kilogram of feed to 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 remove it and uh, so when you when you buy a protein skimmer you need to add adequate space to position so it's a uh, an average of protein skimmer is between 0.7 to 1.2 meter tall and uh, it's very very common to add uh, flocculants or coagulants into the water in the protein skimmer because it's uh, it enhances the, the efficiency of the of the skimming. So one of the methods uh, which is really common is uh, injecting ozone into the, the inlet water and that uh, facilitates the flocculation. However, it's a, it's a bit of a finicky process because because uh, the ozone the amount of ozone which is injected into the protein skimmer shall be precisely calculated and measured because uh, of course if the level is too low it's not going to have the flocculation on the other hand if uh, the level of ozone is too high it actually breaks down organic matter instead of flocculating so it's getting even worse than, than better There are numerous and uh, various types of bacteria and virus can present in the recirculation aquaculture system which uh, need to be removed or deactivated. So one of the most common sterilizer methods in, uh, in RAS is the application of UV radiation. The, the advantage of the application of UV is that uh, it does not change the physical and the chemical characteristics of the water and uh, it does not produce any, any byproducts. In, uh, in, in, the, in the commercial plants, a uh, normal UV dose is uh, in the range between 30 to 35 milliwatt second per square centimeter and uh, this amount is normally adequate for for the proper disinfection so it's uh, uh, removing uh, the logarithmic disinfection of three for most of the aquaculture bacteria which means that it removes 99.999 percent of of all the bacteria in the water So let's talk a bit about the, the UV and the, and the UV radiation. So, so what is a, a ultraviolet light? So the ultraviolet light is uh, between 10 and 400 nanometer, and uh, the most common wavelength used in aquaculture is the UVC radiation with uh, around 260 nanometer because uh, this has the highest potential for, for disinfection. So normally in the, the unit we use in aquaculture, yeah, it has the wavelength between 250 and 260 nanometer. And uh, so what you need to know that actually the UV radiation itself does not kill the bacteria it uh, inactivates it, which means that uh, so the radiation damages the DNA of the bacteria and it uh, inside the DNA it creates the so-called uh, time in time in dimerization, which means that uh, in the inside the DNA, so if there are two time in nucleotides next to each other, they they connect together and when the polymerase reads the DNA, it, uh, it uh, recognizes as a mutation and creates DNA mutation inside, inside the gene. So 
In Africa, there are different types of uh, UV lamps and uh, UV stabilizers available in the market. However, the most commonly used in, in aquaculture is the low pressure, high output lamp, which uh, uses mercury, iridium, amalgam filling. So the low pressure, high output lamp is, uh, is one of the most uh, energy efficient compared to the, the high pressure ones. So basically inside the lamp, there is a piece of solid mercury found and uh, when the lamp is heated up, the mercury evaporates and, uh, and create a vapor. And uh, this vapor emits uh, UV radiation when uh, it's excited to electricity. So, and also, so installing the UV, it's uh, important to position the UV sterilizer after the ozone injection, if you use ozone in the system, especially in marine recirculation aquaculture systems, because uh, so the ozone reacts to different compounds in, uh, in the marine water, and uh, one of them is the bromide, and the salt water, so the ozone oxidizes the bromide into bromate, which is a highly toxic compound. However, the UV has the capability to break down the bromate before the water enters the cultural tank. So when you buy a UV or you design a system, so one thing you need to consider is the flow rate of your system. So that uh, gives you the size of UV you you need to select. So this is what you. So on the on the spec specification of the UV units, so you need to check the the intensity, which is uh, measured in millivolt second per square centimeter. So the normally the around between 30 and 35 millivolt per second of. Uh, per square centimeter UV dose is, uh, is enough to adequately inactivate most of the, most of the bacteria in the, in the water. However, there are certain type of viruses that, uh, that require much higher dose. So you, you have to know your water quality in order to guarantee that uh, you can remove uh, all the harmful microorganisms from the water. The, so it's important so you it's uh, it's important to regularly check the UV light. However never look directly at the UV light because uh, it's uh, it's really harmful. So these modern UV lamps have a, a really long lifespan so the newer technology can actually last up to 16,000 hours, which uh, translates to around uh, two years of, uh, of permanent uh, operation. And uh, so it also it's recommended to change the lamp when the intensity drops below 60%. So below 60%, the intensity is not gonna be enough to, to inactivate the microorganism in, in the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, you need to regularly check the water quality because if there are lots of solids, lots of organic matter, or the water is uh, too murky and turbid, uh, then the microorganism, the bacteria, can hide, and uh, and the UV is not going to be able to remove these microorganisms. So one of the disadvantages of the UV lamps that uh, the lamp itself is not really scalable. So if you want to increase the capacity of the UV, then uh, more lamps shall be shall be added in the in the unit. And uh, for instance, in large scale scale systems is uh, is not uncommon to see UV with uh, 38 lamps as well, which makes 
maintenance and uh, service a bit more difficult. The other common uh, disinfectant or disinfection method used in uh, LAS is uh, the application of ozone. And uh, ozone can be can be bought in uh, in cylinders. However, it's uh, more common and more safe uh, to produce on site by via an ozone generator. So basically, the ozone generator is a unit that uh, creates ozone by applying electric power to a ceramic plate on which the oxygen molecules are broken down into so-called ozone-produced oxidants. So the ozone and these produce the, the oxidants are extremely reactive and uh, they try to bind uh, any kind of available uh, mainly organic sources. So if uh, it finds a, a bacteria or any microorganism, so it can it can severely damage it. So as I mentioned before, so ozone is also is a very effective flocculant. So that's why it's, it's uh, commonly used uh, in combination with protein skimmers to flocculate proteins into large polymers that are easier to be removed. So normally in a, in a S you need around 10 to 15 gram of ozone per kilogram of feed uh, to adequately to remove the harmful microorganism in the water. So the ozone generator can be can be fed by air or oxygen. Uh, air is a cheaper supply, however, it uh, produces in a much 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 lower uh, concentration. So basically, the maximum efficiency you can reach with an air-fed ozone generator is around 10 percent. So in order to increase the the efficiency, you you are recommending to use uh, oxygen instead of air. It also has, uh, so in general, you will not reach still higher concentration. And uh, so whenever you inject uh, ozone into, the, into your system, you need to be aware that uh, the larger part of this gas is actually oxygen itself. So you have to calculate into your your oxygenation design. So and so it's also it's very important to to regularly monitor the ozone levels. Ozone is uh, is poses risk to human and animal health. So therefore, it's a uh, highly highly recommended to have a an ozone detector, an ambient ozone detector in the room wherever the, the ozone is applied. And uh, so ozone is, as I said, it's really, really reactive. And uh, so when you design or build a system, you have to make sure that the pipes and fittings you use for ozone injection must be ozone resistant. So. Normally, we use uh, PTFE pipes. Uh, those are recommended for ozone transfer into the into the water. And uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, so whenever you install an ozone generator, the generator must be located in a well ventilated room or cabinet because the humidity can potentially damage the unit. It is uh, very difficult to directly measure ozone concentration in the water, although companies have started developing ozone sensors. Still, the most common way of measuring ozone is measuring the oxidation reduction potential of the water. So every biochemical process in water changes the conductivity. For instance, so the, we measure the ozone in the, in the biofilter, and in the biofilter, the nitrification takes place. So nitrification is indicated between 
plus 100 and plus 350 millivolt in an S. Therefore, we would like to keep in an optimal value of between 250 and 400 millivolt. So if uh, the sensor is higher value than 400 millivolt, it indicates uh, the higher level of ozone in the biofilter. As I mentioned before, ozone poses hazard risk to human health. Therefore, if you need these values, on the, if you read these values in the ozone, ambient ozone detector, you need to perform the, the following action. So if the, the reading is between 20 to 100 ppb, parts per billion, that indicates there is a leak somewhere in the ozone line. So check the line and uh, find the source of the leak. So normally we use soap and the, and the brush, just brush around with soap on the, every pipe connection and uh, and if it bubbles, it indicates there is a leak on the line. So if the reading is between 100 and 300 ppb, then do not stay more than 20 minutes in the environment and uh, switch off the ozone generator immediately. If the reading is between 300 ppb and 1000 ppb, switch off the generator immediately and uh, prohibit any personnel entering the area until the value drops to the safe level again. When the reading is over 1000 ppb, do not enter the area without protection. Prohibit any personnel entering the area. Use protective gears such as respirator before carrying out any actions. Switch off the generator and wait until the value drops to the safe level again. Uh, as it was uh, discussed in this previous presentation, that the maintaining optimal oxygen level in, in the less is crucial for the survival and the well-being of the fish. So in the less, uh, oxygen can be can be purchased in uh, in cylinders or it can be generated uh, generated on site. So. One of the most common method is uh, the so-called liquid oxygen cylinder, which uh, can accommodate oxygen in a really high density. So one liter of uh, liquid oxygen contains uh, 861 liter of gaseous oxygen. So oxygen can be generated by, a, by an oxygen generator as well. The advantage of the liquid oxygen tank uh, is uh, that it does not require any electricity so therefore if there is a power outage you can still supply oxygen for the fish so that's why so you, if, even if you use an oxygen generator to produce the oxygen on site it is highly recommended to have a pressurized or a liquid oxygen tank as a backup uh, in case of a power cut the most common oxygen generators work on the principle of the so-called pressure swing adsorption, uh, during which process the air passes through a carbon molecule, or sieve or a zeolite, uh, and uh, the oxygen binds to this media. So the absorption takes place in two separate pressure vessels, each filled with, uh, with this media, and uh, and it switches between the separation process and the regeneration process. Oxygen generator is basically a nitrogen generator, but uh, in a nitrogen generator you supply the nitrogen into a tank and you exhaust the rest. However, on the other way around, in an oxygen generator you exhaust the nitrogen and uh, you store you store the rest. So basically, in oxygen generator, the gas which is produced is not only oxygen, but also carbon dioxide and, and uh, other gas can be found in the air. So let's dig into a bit the how the oxygen generator works. 
So basically, oxygen generator is not one unit. It's a, it's a multi-equipment system with uh, multiple processes. The first step is the air first needs to be dried and filtered by an air dryer. And uh, after that, it is transferred into a compressor. So basically, the air must be devoid of any moisture and dust because it can damage the sieve and it can also reduce the efficiency of the, of the oxygen generator. And also it's important that the temperature of the inlet air should be between 10 to 25 degree and the pressure shall be maintained between 4 to 4 and 13 bar. So the compressed air from the compressor flows to the absorber, the absorber tank uh, where uh, nitrogen is separated. So as I mentioned before, so in the PSA, the special swing absorption generator, there are normally two vessels found. Uh, one is uh, for the absorption, other is for the desorption, and, uh, and it alternates the cycle between each other. So basically, so once the air goes into to one chamber at, and it uh, so the sieve fills up with the uh, with the oxygen and uh, and in the second uh, tank uh, the sieve is cleaned so basically the the oxygen is removed from the sieve into a and into a production tank uh, and uh, and whenever it finished and it becomes empty so then it's getting filled up again from the from the compressor so basically the two vessels alternately cycle between uh, between absorbing the oxygen or feeding back to the back to the culture tank and uh, so it's important to to mention that uh, so it, it is recommended to keep the oxygen purity level at least over 92%. Uh, otherwise, uh, so the quality will be highly compromised. It is very important that the nitrogen outflow must always be channeled out from the room. Otherwise, the ambient air will have severely reduced oxygen level and entering the room can be potentially life-threatening. So after generating the oxygen is uh, is not enough just uh, so directly directly leading the oxygen into the into the system. So you need to properly saturate into the water in order to keep uh, stable and keep it available for the fish in the culture tanks. So there are two common methods used in aquaculture is uh, so one of the saturation cone and uh, and the other is the venture so basically so in, a, in an oxygen cone inside the cone uh, there is a so-called uh, bubble swarm action takes place so so inside the cone there is a, the, the gaseous top layer and uh, and the liquid bottom layer so the water enters from the top and uh, the water is cascading through this gaseous oxygen layer and uh, the high velocity of the water breaks down the oxygen and creates a so-called bubble swarm with the where you're going to have a large uh, water and gas interface. So as the cone widens toward the bottom, the bubble swarm will grow and the uh, water slows down until it is slower than the bubbles buoyant velocity so it prevents the bubbles escaping from the bottom discharge uh, therefore there are no bubbles found in the discharge water only only dissolved gas and uh, so the other most common way is the the venturi injector which uh, works on the, the Bernoulli principle. So the Bernoulli, the Bernoulli's law states that uh, 
so the pressure always tend to equalize so in this venture so as the fluid travels through a pipe it narrows down in a point uh, and uh, in this point the velocity of the water increases while the pressure drops so so the water inside the venture tries to compensate the pressure drop by sucking uh, pressure of the yeah, whatever connected in the suction port and uh, if you connect an oxygen or ozone line in this point it's automatically it automatically starts uh, uh, sucking the, the the gas into into the water so basically so if you install a venture so it's important to to set up the pressure difference properly in order to create uh, adequate suction in this point and uh, it is also it's important mentioning in any either of the of the setup either you use a cone or a venture it's important to constantly monitor the dosing uh, and not to inject high level of oxygen basically not to inject over 150 200 percent of saturation because uh, this can uh, this high level of gas can damage the gears of the fish and can cause a so-called gas bubble disease and uh, keep in mind that uh, oxygen is more soluble in seawater than in fresh water actually grass is a constantly evolving uh, technology and uh, one of the newest uh, development in grass is the so-called nanobubble generator so basically in a conventional aeration technology you can achieve less than three percent of oxygen transfer efficiency which means that uh, the amount of oxygen you inject into the water less than three percent will be available to the fish so there are companies trying to develop new technologies to to overcome this uh, this challenge and one of them is the nanobubble generator which is able to reach over 85 percent efficiency so how do nanobubble generator works so nanobubble generators produces as the name defines uh, really small uh, suspended uh, suspended bubbles which uh, becomes uh, retained in the water way longer and dispersed more evenly in the liquid than uh, compared to to traditional uh, oxygen or any kind of uh, gas injection systems so it remains much it's, it remains stable much longer in the water and uh, so basically until they interact with, uh, with the surface or any contaminants they will be available the temperature regulation in the uh, rest system may be necessary depending on the climate the culture species the selection of equipment can also depend on the size of the system the heat pumps creating heat exchangers heaters are the most commonly used ones so heaters are okay, one of the simple solutions and uh, they are useful in especially small system so they are comparatively cheap and uh, and easy to operate and maintain so on the downside so yeah they are not really suitable for large systems so you need uh, a number of units in order to keep the water heated up and uh, and they, they are only capable of heating and not cooling the water so in most of the heaters so there's a thermostat found uh, which is attached to the to the heating element so it switches off automatically when the heater reaches the desirable temperature and uh, so when you install a heater you have to make sure that uh, there are no air pockets found inside your unit because it 
can cause overheating and potentially damage the unit. The other common equipment uh, regulating uh, the temperature in the US is the heat exchanger. So the heat exchangers work on a principle of that the heat is always transferred from the hot medium to the cold one. The heat exchange will occur until the temperature between the two media reaches equilibrium. Yeah, one of the most common uh, heating uh, equipment is the, the plate heat exchanger. So basically the heat plate heat exchanger consists of uh, gasketed metal plates uh, stacked tightly to each other and uh, so the fluids so there are two fluids one uh, is uh, our system water and the other is the 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 water the heat transfer water uh, so these two waters are flowing through the the metal plates in the in the opposite direction and uh, and they don't mix so so the one fluid passes through every second uh, plate and uh, alternating with the other fluid uh, and uh, so during this process the water fluid uh, giving up the heat to the cooler one so this process actually so this process goes until the the temperature of the two fluids equalizes the, so if you want to increase the capacity of the unit, so you need to increase the number of the, the number of the plates. So the heat exchanger is actually commonly used for recovering energy from a hot water source. And uh, so one of the advantages that uh, so you can use in a salt water for the heat exchange purposes and uh, so heating up fresh water with a salt water source or cooling down and uh, what is important uh, during operation that uh, so sort of heat the plate heat exchanger require a regular cleaning uh, because the fooling on the plates can dramatically reduce the, the heat transfer you need to know that a certain amount of fooling is inevitable so therefore, so if you design a system and you design a heat exchanger, you have to take into consideration that uh, so the capacity is going to be a bit lower. So you need to always a bit oversize the heat exchanger. And, uh, and uh, also it's important to have a proper water velocity through the heat exchanger. So optimal water velocity may help reducing the fooling. The other common equipment uh, for heating cooling purposes is the heat pump. So inside the heat pump, so there's a cycle. So the liquid cool refrigerant flows into an evaporator via an expansion valve. And uh, here it turns into cool gas by ventilating air into the evaporator. So then this gas uh, flows into the compression valve where its uh, temperature will rapidly increase due to being exposed to high pressure. So the hot flows into the contact chamber where it precipitates heat to the, to the incoming system motor. So one of the advantages of the heat pumps is that the valves can be open to the other direction so by which the cool gas enters the contact chamber, therefore it's going to cool the water down. So you can alternate the cycle between uh, cooling and heating. So they are, they are very efficient uh, and uh, easily automated equipment. Uh, so the new units can be controlled uh, via a mobile phone with a, with a Wi-Fi network. So also the heat pumps can be set for automatic operation and uh, in this setup uh, 
your temperature will be constantly adjusted to cool or heat if you just you just need to set up the the desirable desirable temperature it's also important to mention so when you install heat pump so you have to position the heat pump in a place that uh, it can extract the heat out from the environment so it, it must be always uh, ideally outside outside of the room to let the the hotel or the cool air out from the system the efficiency of the heat pump is uh, expressed in the so-called coefficients of performance which is the relationship between the power drawn out of the heat pump as cooling or heat and the power that is supplied to the compressor so as you can see in this diagram so in order to to change few degrees it requires less energy but after a certain point uh, so the energy requirement for cooling or heating the water is exponentially growing and uh, I forgot to mention before so when you design a system with a heat pump uh, so you have to consider that uh, when the water is heated uh, it uh, must always be aerated because uh, because if the 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 water inside the pipe becomes equilibrium to the ambient uh, environment uh, it can become super saturated with gas and uh, this super saturation can create uh, gas bubble disease for the fish as i was uh, mentioned in the previous presentation so it's uh, it's important to keep the the pH in the water between 7 and 8 so the alkalinity declines over time to time and eventually the CO2 produced by the fish respiration will lower the, lower the water pH so one of the most common methods of increasing the water pH is by, by adding uh, chemicals so most commonly sodium bicarbonate or, or lie so in the systems uh, the, the sodium bicarbonate can be added manually or it can also be dosed via a dosing pump uh, which can also be set to an automatic uh, uh, dosing setup and uh, connected to a, to a monitoring system so it's also during so not only the CO2 but uh, the nitrification also drops the, the pH, pH of the system so normally normally in pH regulation we want to increase the pH so it's uh, it's not common that uh, you need to lower the pH in a vessel creation aquaculture system Uh, these are the main components in the rest I wanted to show you around and thank you for your attention if you have any questions or thoughts about that just don't hesitate to reach me out on this email address and on the phone number thank you bye bye